started. Welcome to Scrolling. This is episode 136. I'm Ket, and today I have a special guest. Uh, he's one of the masterminds behind the infamous God Mode pre-made Battleground Squad. He's a top-tier theory crafter, an incredibly skilled player, and he does all that from a bad hospital guest Wi-Fi connection. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Constine. How you doing, man? I'm doing great. Awesome. Cool. Good to have you here, dude. If you don't mind, I'm going to ask you a handful of questions here just to give listeners an idea of who you are. So first of all, if you if you don't mind, um, just give us a little rundown of your ESO journey. When you started playing, what what your experience has been like? So I started playing in I think it was like late November 2019. So actually not too long ago. I'll be able to start playing when the game came out. Um, and I exclusively just do battlegrounds. Mm -hmm. I'm the co leader of God Mode, which is a battleground guild that focuses on four man group play, duos, solos. And we did some IC and probably bring that back coming next patch. We started that sometime in 2020, maybe 2021. Um, we've competed in some tournaments in CP and in BG tournaments. We also have, to have some dual representation. We've done organized 4v4s against some of the best teams in Battlegrounds, and we generally come out on top. And I'd like to think that we also represent all Battleground players, as a lot of open world players don't talk highly of Battleground players. That's true. I've noticed that. Yeah, um, and in this last year, we've we swapped more from like 4v4v4 4v4 style to 4v4 to battle some of the top groups. Um, and in that process, I did want to give you a shout out, Stoons Goons, for helping us get that 4v4 team ready. Oh, yeah, yeah, you're very welcome. It's been fun for us, too. You know, we're kind of just we've just started dipping our toes into that sort of, you know, pre-made sort of world so we're still learning you guys have helped us learn and we're kind of helping you guys refine your squad and everything it works out for everybody and we didn't know they were going to go to this 4v4 stuff we, we were just doing it just to get kind of tournament ready and you guys have improved massively you guys have gotten a lot better okay. um, i can tell your coordination your theory crafting play styles positioning everything's improved and I, i'd like to say that ours has improved as well Oh, yeah. Yeah. Thanks, man. I think a lot of it for us has been just finding the comp that really gels with us that we really like doing. You know, we've tried a lot of different things and we're I think we're starting to kind of figure out what what our style is. All right. Next question. Um, so what's what's your main or your favorite class to play in PvP? Do I have a favorite? I'm not sure. I kind of sometimes you like to do that monkey damage where you just ape out damage all over the place. And that's generally that's DK. I played DK for a long time. I was hitting over 8 million damage games a lot, wow. um, which is fun. And, you know, it's an APM style. I like like a one where it's I'd have high recoveries on like a DK. Where I'm talking like 2,500. And I would just go. That's know, high on a DK. Really, really high APM. But I think skill wise, I think I'm probably best on Nightblade. Um, I tried to stay away from the Frost Staff Nightblade setup for a long time. I just, I just play Lightstaff in every build. It's obviously the meta. Um, I staff is wrong. Yeah, I don't see any Nightblade not using Ice Staff. So I, I ended up going back to it. When I went back to it, I feel like I'm just unkillable, unbeatable. It's it's so strong. Like, the Nightblade is really, really strong. And this nerf is is really necessary, honestly, to Shadow Cloak. Yeah, uh, nerf for some play styles, buff for other play styles, perhaps. Yes, yes. Uh, uh, yeah, I always I think I associate you with Nightblade or Sorcerer. Those are kind of the two that I think of when I think of Constantine. Okay, and next question, uh, briefly, just what are your general thoughts on this uh, this update forty four with the battlegrounds changes and stuff? You know, I think it's a positive needed change if they keep paying attention to PvP. That is, it seems like at the very least they're making an effort. ESO is still second to none in combat over any MMO out there. It's unique in how you can create different builds with many different play styles. Uh, if, you, if they can get their marketing down and continue to provide updates to PvP, uh, Update 44, I think, can be a very good thing. Yeah, I think, it, I think it will be a positive thing. Just the fact that they're putting energy into Battlegrounds in any capacity at all is going to draw attention to it, and certainly aspects will be improved. I, I think I'll miss the three-team thing. Like I think after the new has worn off, you know, time has passed, and... It's like the new norm, you know. I think I'm going to be 
reminiscent of the old three team system, but this will be good too. You know, I know a lot of people really, really have been wanting a, a two team situation for a long time. So I, I think you know, they should have done it one. separate, you know, like three teams is it's fun in its own way. Cause you gotta worry. There's a lot more factors to worry about with three teams. Yeah. The two teams it's, you know, four V four is, I love four V four. It's fun. You know, it's, it's small group play. There's the, you got to find the weak points, you know, it's more intricate. However, and more competitive too. However, in, in, you know, 4v4v4, there's an extra team involved. And now it's it's a lot more positioning. You have to force yourself through a team if you're going to be the pressuring team. There's all these different aspects that play into it. And it's it's a lot more difficult to play in that aspect. Yeah, and it opens up, like, different, like, comp options and stuff like that. Like, with a three-team situation, you don't necessarily have to have the best comp to win, you know? Like, you can kind of outsmart the other two teams and play in such a way where you really do come out on top. Whereas if it were just like a straight two team situation, you know, you wouldn't be able to do that. So it just kind of opens up different possibilities. I like that. Yeah, me too. Well, cool, man. Well, um, let's just get into to the meat of the matter here. First of all, we'll just kind of quickly go through uh, what's going on on the gold vendor this weekend. Uh, so to start off with the jewelry, we have rings. It's really not a great gold vendor. We have aspect of Mazatun. We have Blood Moon, Call of the Undertaker, and Void Collar. Those are the rings. Uh, Blood Moon might be one to be interested in. That's the one that increases your light attack speed and light attack damage. I know like werewolves like to use that. Or maybe like a, I don't know, like an overload sork. Would that, I don't know if you, they, they would even want to use that or not. But that's one that can be good. It can be very strong. Um... Void Collar is like the the light armor version of Warrior's Fury. You can stack a bunch of weapon spell damage. I don't know if people even really use that anymore. Not a great gold vendor. The monster, the monster sets, their shoulders, a Lambrus and Tremor Scale, two vanilla things that you probably already have. So I can probably just ignore the gold vendor this week. Anything to say about those, Constantine? Uh, the Blood Moon would be interesting. On a sword. I didn't even think about that. The light attack overloads. You'd have to like really time it and build it up, though. Or have like a really high amount of alt going into that. But yeah, that could be really strong, actually. Yeah, I guess if you just want to do like nothing but overloads for a while. I normally think of <laughs> overload like I'm weaving it with other abilities so that that increased speed isn't really going to matter in that case. But if you just want to spam a bunch of overloads really fast, it could maybe that could do something. It could be a lot of pressure. Yeah. Well, yeah. So Gold Vendor, a little bit of a dud this week. But yeah, maybe that Blood Moon. Maybe, maybe check that out. Especially if you play a werewolf. All right, well, let's talk about PTS. So Update 44 is coming up here in a few weeks. Uh, PTS weeks two and three have passed, so we'll talk about kind of the, the stuff that's going on on there. First of all, with the, with the new Battleground situation, some changes there, uh, very uh, controversial changes, I would say. Like, the forums were, were kind of on fire for a couple of days there. So uh, first of all, both 4v4 and the 8v8 queues have a, a solo and group mode. So that means there are four total queues now. And that seems like a bummer to me. That seems like uh, long queue times is what that sounds like to me. I'm, I'm really not super pumped about that. I know a lot of people really want to be able to play solo and not have to worry about going up against people who are grouped up. I kind of get that, but I feel like we're throwing the baby out with the bathwater here with that one there. What do you think, man? I think there is a limited number of people currently playing Battlegrounds. And if there's four modes and splitting up that player base, it's going to be pretty long queues, potentially. Yeah, I'm really thinking so. You know, I think the 4v4 mode, they, they kind of, you know, that's the, the competitive mode. That's what they're calling it. It's the competitive mode. So I would think, like, you should just expect to go up against squads in that mode you know like that's just what that is and if you want to play solo that's what the eight v8s are for so i agree did they did they make the eight v8s uh four man queues still or is it going to go down to duo you think uh in their patch notes there was a, a dev comment that said that making it a duo thing is outside the scope of this update for now or something along those lines so it, it's still a max group size of four unless you do the solo queue Okay, I mean, we could always organize duos into 8v8s for like an 8v8 night or something. That could be really fun. Yeah, we can. We, we certainly can. I just, you know, I mean, I'm sure it won't be a problem at first because it's like the new update. Everyone's excited to check out the new stuff. I'm sure the queue times will be, you know, popping off for a month or two. But like, like I said, after some time passes, this is all just the new normal now. It's not exciting anymore. I feel like those queue times are going to be 
not great. But they can always change things again in the future. You know, they they do that a lot. And I hope they do. I mean, MMR, honestly, if if they're going to do four different queues that you can sign up for, MMR shouldn't really be a thing, actually, because then queue times wouldn't be that bad. We'd have a lot more people to choose from and play against. At least in those solo queues, maybe that would make sense. Yeah, yeah I agree. Uh, speaking of MMR, they added MMR to all queues. So originally, the 8v8s had no MMR. It was just a total free for all, which I, th- I think it's a good thing that they added MMR to that um, in general. So MMR everywhere. Speaking of MMR, though, uh, it's no longer visible. That was one of the, like the mo- most exciting things about this update was like you can actually see your MMR ranking compared to everyone else. They took that away this week in PTS. You can no longer actually see your MMR, which is like, why? Why take that away? But anyway. I, I, I kind of get that. Um, I wanted to point out one more thing, too. Oh, yeah. I think they need to remove the rounds. Every time we yes. played rounds, it was pretty rough. It was very slow. Uh, it was not a fast transition. It was kind of glitchy. And in some of the game modes where like, if you just die once like the your team's just dead for like 10 minutes <laughs> yes the rounds are a bad idea there are they they could implement it differently where it would work okay like uh like if someone runs out of lives the round should end immediately if they did it that way then we can and then you know you lose that round and then that, that would work in that case but like if some if you're permanently down a player and you have to play the rest of that round you know outnumbered you have no chance, you know, if it's like every, all, all other things equal, you have zero chance of, of coming back from that. Right. If the teams are already unfair um, or not balanced, uh, depending on RNG, then having lives isn't ideal either. Or if your team's just like hit a bad round or something, yeah, there's just no chance. And you just kind of like when we were playing against um, some of the other teams, they just kind of had to like sit there and get killed because we were... Uh, beating them we kill one person and the other team's like okay i guess we just all die just stand there and you know it's like what's the point so they should just have lives and we'll let them reset and stuff yeah because it's it's only going to punish the weaker team like it's presumably it will always be the weaker team who has someone running out of lives so that happens and now they're even weaker you know like it's it just punishes the weaker team for being weaker i don't i don't like that at all so um in the in the 8v8 death match there are no lives, there are no rounds. But then in the competitive 4v4 deathmatch, it's only with lives and rounds. That's the only option there is now. So, yeah, exactly like what we're saying here. They're going to go in the complete opposite direction. It's a bad move. They just need to delete that whole idea, or at least, like I said, make it so that the round ends as soon as somebody runs out of lives. And that, that could work in that case. Yeah, we've played with a total of 12 people. All 12 people agreed the rounds were a terrible idea. Yeah. Yeah, it's not good. And then in the 4v4, the land grab modes, the ones with where you stand on flags, uh, there are no rounds and no lives on any of those, like the domination. And Is there a crazy king where the flags move around? I don't know. But no rounds or lives there. Yeah, and that's what's going on with Battlegrounds, pretty much. So yeah, there's four queues now. There's a, there's a group and solo queue for both 4v4 and 8v8. Uh, they added MMR to everything. Uh, you can no longer see your MMR, which is a bummer. And uh, yeah, they, they took lives and rounds away from the 8v8s and they made them not optional in, in the 4v4. Well, so, we'll see how it goes. Moving on, uh, so some, some class changes here. Warden, their glacial presence passive, now increases the chance of applying the chilled status from any source rather than only winter's embrace abilities and that's a 200 percent increase to uh to apply that that status it's really good you know there's a lot of chilled or a lot of frost damage options with scribing of course you have the destro staff i think that makes this passive a lot more usable and 200 percent increased chance to apply status is pretty juicy too so that's good i think that's good yeah i don't know if there's a soft cap on that but that has a lot of potential for a pretty solid frost warden build yeah, and you know, like the the frost warden thing has been kind of taken down a few pegs recently, so this kind of makes that more of an option now, which is good. And right. you know, I know you said you said you have like a really nasty warden build you're going to talk about, and you have we have those uh, those mechanical acuity wardens running around that that can be really threatening. But outside of like these niche kind of builds, I really don't see a lot of wardens that are offensively threatening that I'm like really afraid of dying to you know like at the very least i can always just kind of run away from them and or just strafe around them and i'm not really getting a lot of damage 
So I think they actually could use a little bit of offensive help. So this Maybe this will help them some. Azure Blight Reaper. This is controversial. <laughs> uh, it's good and bad. I think something needed to happen with Azure Blight, but as often is the case, I think they went a little overboard with it. So uh, they reduced the base damage by 60%. They increase the scaling per target to 100% per additional enemy instead of 30%. Uh, and then now it has a cap of 600% instead of 180. So the increased damage now uh, only increases after hitting more than one target rather than directly increasing against just one target. So now you have to hit a total of seven targets to reach that cap uh, rather than six. Uh, and here it is, okay? The, the damage increase now only works against monsters. Now, uh, I just want to clarify, it's the damage, it's the scaling that only happens against monsters. This still will proc on players. You still will build the stacks and get the explosion and all that stuff. But the base damage is reduced by 60% and there is no scaling against players. So you're just getting that, you know, really, really weak damage and nothing else, basically. You know, I'm not sure if this was necessary. Um, I mean, for the 8v8, that has a Zerblight could have been really strong. Yes. Um, but if we're going like, we're talking like 4v4, it's by no means meta at all. It, it certainly could have used a nerf, maybe a scaling nerf, um, to where it could have been still used in like 8v8. But they'd completely nuke the set. I mean, it's going to have like, it's oh. going to hit somebody for like a thousand. <laughs> it's going to be yeah, really bad. I don't see the point of just completely removing it as an option in PvP. Yeah, like if we could have just tweaked some numbers a little bit. Like, yeah, you're right. Like in 4v4, it, it certainly can be strong. But like like last night, we had some pre-mades going. We were using Azure Blight in our group. And, you know, we were by no means, you know, the dominant team, you know. No, we get to build into it. And to build into it is a is kind of a sacrifice. Like you actually have to, you know, uh, an Arcanist is kind of like can become natural if you're going to use Beam and stuff. But you still have to beam, right? So you still have to land the beam. You still, you know, it's still an active thing that needs to happen. Um, or you would have to run a bunch of like sticky dots or ground dots to actually keep it proc. Right. And if you're doing that, then generally you're sacrificing something to make the build worthwhile. And so it's not like again by any means meta. Yeah, I think like I mean, obviously, I think their concern is the eight v eights. Like this, the Azure Blight as it is right now would be pretty nasty in a in an eight v eight. But yeah, they just, I think they just needed to tweak the scaling a little bit and it would still be a usable set, not overpowered. I mean, we're too late in the PTS cycle. I'm pretty sure this is just how it's going to be, but, you know, we'll see. And then uh, Nightblade, uh, uh, an interesting one, the Shadow Cloak ability. Remember, um, we talked about on the last episode, it's a toggle now. You, you push the cloak button and you stay cloaked forever until you run out of Magicka. Not so much the case now, this ability and the shadowy disguise morph, so that the invisibility morph, now only disables your magicka recovery while you're actively moving, rather than while the ability is active. The, there is a dev comment, it's a really long comment, but basically they, uh, they compare this to like the, just the basic sneaking mechanic that everybody can do when you crouch and turn invisible that way. They say that this is a lot more intuitive because it functions just like that. When you're standing still, you're not draining resources. When you start moving, you are draining resources. So you just don't have to crouch now. You can hit this, you can hit the cloak button, you are permanently invisible. And then when you start moving, it'll start draining your magicka. When you stop moving, you know, you get your magicka back. It's a weird one. It seems like this is very much um, snipe spammers. It's for them. You know, I feel like it's very specifically for that kind of play style. Someone who likes to just kind of sit in a hidey spot, sit and wait for a, for a target to show up and then ambush them. Yeah. I'm not a huge fan of how this works. Um, generally, I'll use it just to get that vamp buff, just for like the 300 weapon damage, which turns into five plus 500 plus weapon damage, uh, depending on your build, um, which is very strong. I'll use it just mainly offensively, just very quickly. Now I do use it defensively, of course, but I, I, it's kind of a heavy nerf on it. I, I mean, they, they could have just made it to where it's easier to get them out of, out of cloak or something. Uh, it could have increased the cost um, in a different way. I'm not a big fan of the toggle where it's it's basically double tapping your mag cost because uh, you could you could hit it but then you get that you know a two that two second proc of your mag recovery and it could almost instantly give that that mag back but now you hit it and it takes that like let's say you hit it right before the end of that global it takes that two second part away and 
now it basically doubled the cost of your cloak like instantly. Yeah, I don't love it. It seems like very much um, targeted at like a new player, like the new player experience. I think if you weren't already familiar with how cloak works right now, this would probably be an easier thing to grasp and to, you know, to figure out how to use if you've never played this game before or anything like that. And, you know, we, we've talked about this in the last episode, but like Nightblade surely is the most popular class choice for a new player. And I think I really think they just want the class to be easier to play and easy, easier to pick up. It's actually a pretty hard class to master. Um, it seems like they've been kind of, you know, there's like zero buff management necessary on this class anymore. Everything's just permanently active always, you know, and now Cloak <laughs> is is the same way, more or less. It's probably a little bit harder to play because um, now you're going to have to try to man manage your resources, which is one of the hardest things to do as a new player is to figure out how to manage your resources well. So I imagine this actually ends up being more difficult to play. You're going to be spamming siphoning strikes to try to get that back. It's going to hurt their health. And they got to go back, get out of stealth, hit your hit your vigor and get your health back up, go back into stealth, hit your siphoning and rinse repeat kind of thing. Yeah, it's true because it, like it, it totally disabling your mag recovery unless you stand still. That kind of yeah forces you to have to find a hidey spot and just sit there. But you could just crouch in regular stand stealth. Then. <laughs> we have a segment here that I, I chose uh, the title for this segment: Constine's tips for creating a godlike pre-made squad. Constantine, you have some uh, some advice for people who are thinking about maybe putting together an organized, pre-made four-man squad. Um, so what do you got, man? What do you got for us? All right. So there's a, quite a bit to go into here. When setting up a team, you need to have an idea of how you're going to land kills and how you're going to counter damage. So who fits best in what role? Play style matters. If someone has very high APM, then they would likely fit best into that type of role. So looking at each build on editor, when you're looking at, uh, when you've set up that uh, editor for each person, so there's four of them, who's going to fit best in the role that has the uh, highest APM? Generally, it's the healer that has the highest APM, but you could have a DPS depending if you're running pressure or not. Also, who would fit best into like target calling role? Uh, which means that person needs to have experience and the ability to multitask they need to have very good situational awareness and swapping targets very quickly. Like it has to happen within an instant. Because uh, you could have somebody marked, you go in and you hit alts at the same time, and then the guy next to him goes down to like 10% health. You need to turn real quick and remark a different target. So your group, because everything can get crazy, but you need to have that ability to shift targets immediately and guide your team that way. Because so target calling, in my opinion, is the most important role on the team. Because they, they, they handle alts, timing, everything. In the play style record, like I said, is, is often seen in the build editor before you even play the build. Uh, there's, now, there's different comp types. There's burst, burst pressure, full pressure. You have an AOE focus or a single target focus. You can take any of those three and then make it AOE or single target. Uh, most of the time, people are trying to go AOE with single target. You can do both, but... You could also potentially do all single target focus. It could be very effective. I've seen some builds like that. Yeah, it's a very effective strategy. You know, like you think like you're you're going up against a group of people, so you you might think you want AOE to hit everybody, but it's actually super effective to just select one single target and just focus the hell out of them. And you're basically taking one player out of the equation because they have they have no choice but to just go a full defense, which means they can't go offense. And your your healer can out heal in that case, you know, if you're only taking DPS from two people. Right. And then you just need like that you give them small, only small opportunities to alt and, and attack you. And if you have good timed rest of alts or um, barriers or gibbers, whatever you're using, then that could easily prevent them from getting that offensive sweep on you. And then you just go back to being offensive. It's really important to constantly theory craft and micromanage a comp at the higher level. So we have roughly like five comps that were constantly in comms they're talking about in text. 90% of which we're never going to use. We have like a main comp and an all comp and then we just kind of throw stuff together. But uh, it's important that you discover the weaknesses and strengths of each comp type. 
And that allows you to, if you're fighting a comp, you're like, oh, okay, we've we've literally kind of made a comp similar to this. So what are the weaknesses here when you're fighting it? You can discover the weaknesses while you're fighting that comp. And it helps as the target caller as well, because I'm the target caller for my comp. Uh, to be like, oh, okay, I, we, we've, we've seen this before. How do we kill this? And then I mark the, the weak link, and we go after them. Another important thing is footage review. You want to do footage review of games from each person's perspective, and you want to give positive criticism. Because um, it sounds like you're micromanaging, and you kind of are, but in a good way. Reviewing the footage allows your group to not only see each other's roles from a different perspective, um, what they're doing every time you're going in, but you also see the small things that really matter, especially in like a burst comp. Because if one person's off by a second, that's an entire global that the other team can heal or counter alt. We fight a lot of teams that have like four uh, resto staffs, and so there's there's a lot of healing happening in each global. Yeah, or even just like one good crit on a polar wind. You know, I mean, all it takes is one global to fill a health bar all the way back up. You know. Right. So if if you're not timing stuff with you need, I'd say within one global, you can't miss more than one global. Otherwise, that, that you need to practice more or some, sometimes stuff happens and you get stunned or rooted. Things just don't line up properly. Um, and it often results in not getting the kill. So burst comps are can be look easy to play, but they can also be very difficult to play. You got to get the, all that stuff down. Uh, each person has a specific role to correct these things and make your comp that much stronger. Um, another thing is reviewing CMX. So that's the add on. Seeing buff up times is also crucial. Let's just say there's two mirror comps. So two four mans fighting in the exact same setups builds comp. One team has 85% uptime on, let's just say, your major resolve from the warden. And the other team has 95%. Well, that can make a massive difference in kill potential. The team with the lower buff coverage, well, that's 6k penetration you're basically giving to the team for 10% of the uptime. These things matter because 6k pen is a lot, or even minor resolve. If your minor resolve wasn't up, you're giving the other team the equivalent of Crimson Oath. Right, for every player. Right. So, And I've seen it where teams will have like 60% uptime on minor resolve and 85% uptime on major resolve. Well, you're, there could have been a time where they both were down and now you're giving us you know, almost 10,000 penetration. That's a big deal. And uh, I'm going to go back to Target Caller. Uh, again, this is one of the most important roles on the team. Requires that good multitasking. Uh, target Caller identifies the weak link in the enemy team, marks the targets, ensures ults before time and, and timing them. They call out body blocking and cross healing. So when another team ults, oftentimes I will jump in front of whoever they're on. They're clearly on because um, I'm generally more healthy or tanky, depending on what I'm playing. And I will make sure that it's a lot harder to target that person. When they're going in, um, I don't know if you guys have noticed that I do that, but I I often do it when um, somebody's attacking like Shoddy or somebody else on my team. Yeah, that's that's something I do too. Uh, body blocking is hugely valuable. Just jump in between your teammate and the person attacking them, so that you know at least some of those attacks are hitting you instead. Yeah, it's a definitely a very good thing to do. Yeah, they need to be watching the other team's damage setup and call it out to the healer, and uh, it, that shouldn't necessarily be your job. Um, but it's always good to just have better communication because every once in a while they might miss something and they like, might not see that they've hit the alt because a lot of things are happening in a game. And so I always call it out. Oh, alts. Also, sometimes depending on the weak link, you can bait a defensive alt from the enemy that either reduces their offensive pressure so that your team keeps them on their back foot or opens the door to get a kill with alts when you see that they rest an alt or barrier or jibber. Um, this can be done with good timing or having... Uh, your weakest DPS in a pressure comp use their alt and have the other team hit their defensive alt thinking your team is alting. So the target caller is very, very, very important. We've, we've, we've won games with that, which, you know, is, is a, actually a close win. If we had to bait there, we couldn't get a kill. And so we had our, like, our weakest person in the comp hit their alt because they just reactively hit their barrier. And then we just alt after that one. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's smart. Outlaw Red is asking if we're going to cover the arc changes. Um, all the arc changes happened in week one of the PTS. I don't think anything further has happened to them. And we talked about that stuff on the last episode. So you might go back and, and check that out. Me and Ironworks discussed that. But long story short, I, I'm not so sure that the, the defensive nerfs they got were necessary because they their offensive kit is so lacking. They kind of need that defensiveness so that they can build into damage. And I think this is actually going to hurt them quite a bit. 
that's that's kind of the short answer. But yeah, go go listen to the last episode, Red, and see what you think about that, man. Um, I also really wanted to harp that there's just not a clear meta, and every comp we have does have a slight weakness somewhere in OCP. It's it just does, and so does all comps. So full pressure, burst pressure, full burst, they're all viable. All the top teams have somewhere you can exploit. Another reason to review footage and see where things went right and went wrong against a strong team. And finding a hole in their armor of a strong team. It can be seen sometimes only by frame by frame. Uh, which just means like if you, if you see that, oh wow, we got them to 15%. Okay, oh, you could have hit this? Okay, so if we had hit this at the same time, they die. Right, so it's it's one of those things where it's timing can be very crucial, and you can get those down when you review footage and things. Um, and I've, another thing is, you know, I've heard over and over somebody say, "There's nothing we could have done to win." I got globaled. I was out of resources, but is that actually true? Could the team have stacked and body blocked? Could you have used in a move pot defensively? Did we predict damage well enough to have Jibber Barrier Rest Alt ready to counter the damage? How quickly did you call out that you needed help? Did you block properly? There's a lot of factors that play into it. It's not as simple as that. Even the squishiest build when they're blocking, they're not going to die instantly through their block. Yeah, and you can, um, you know, you you can manage your resources in such a way where that just doesn't happen, where you don't get stammed out. You know, like, I mean, I know it, it just happens sometimes, but I think it's if your build is right and if you're playing smart, it really shouldn't happen all that often. I don't think. That's kind of wraps up my tips for the guy like pre mid. Oh, sweet man, very helpful stuff. Uh, listeners will do well to listen up. This is one of, if not the best, battleground squad on PCNA. So uh, if you're if you're looking to put together a squad of your own, this is, this is definitely some advice you want to pay attention to. Craft. We'll talk about some builds. Uh, I have a couple of builds I'm just going to get through really quick here. Uh, I've been playing a lot with a range plar here lately. Butch Mahoney is his name. Uh, re- very basic build. This is just something I've been taking into the solo queue. If I'm just kind of, if I'm just kind of in the mood to cruise, you know, I don't want to have to try too hard, but I want to be effective. This is kind of my go-to for that. Uh, it's a very basic build. It's just orders wrath double bar. Wretched back bar with a bow, Asylum staff on the front bar. I've been going back and forth between Lightning and Flame. I think I like the Lightning better. Uh, Sithis Helm, One Piece Magma. Really simple, I've, and really all I do is I just put a few dots on them and spam Force Pulse, and then beam when they're low. Javelin when I want to stun them. It's like, there's not even really a combo, you know? It's just dots and a spammable and an execute. And I'm healing people when they need it. I'm putting the Cleansing Circle. I'm kind of flexing in between like a supportive role or an offensive role, just... Whatever the situation requires, that's what I'm doing. It's kind of my favorite way to play, and I think that really is the Templar's strength, uh, is kind of being in that, like, all modes all the time at once. Really good bar, A really good setup for that. Order's Wrath is great for that, because you're getting healing power and offensive power from it. It's fun. It's a, it's a, it's a really basic build, but it, like I said, it's just an easy one to play. And then another build that I've had, uh, that I've been using, actually just the last couple of days, somewhat inspired by you, Constantine, because I saw you using a similar build. Uh, it's an Arcanist. Using uh, Plague Break and Draugrkin, Draugrkin on the fr- on the front bar, uh, using Rune Blades as the spammable, and uh, and then the Wield Soul scribing ability with the stun, the Anchorite's Cruelty. That's the script that consumes a Soul Gem and does Oblivion damage over time. Very very strong. And then I have the Major Defile script on that as well. So you get the Major Defile from that. Plague has guaranteed Minor Defile. And Draugrkin's just amping up the damage of, you know, of all the dots and everything. The, you know, the rune blades hit three times, so Draugrkin's, Draugrkin applies to each one of those. Plus, it's a charged weapon, so, you know, you're, you're applying statuses at a very high frequency. Draugrkin's attaching itself to all of those things. Just a really great setup. I was telling you right before we uh, started recording, and I know you've experienced this for yourself. You'll, you'll roll up on a fight where people are all just kind of piled on top of each other, like there's this big brawl going on. You start throwing the damage into that, and everyone just starts scattering. They start panicking because it's just so much damage. And it's actually kind of hard to just make someone fight you because they're so, like, freaked out by the damage, they just start evading and running away, and you have to chase them down. It's like one of the nastiest builds I've ever played. Very, very good. Plague and Draugrkin. You could use uh, Force Pulse as the spammable as well. I just like using the Rune Blades because it's just different. And, and they are very strong. You have an AoE component to it as well. Spreads that... um 
that plague break around really nicely. Yeah, those are the two builds I have to talk about. Constine, you have a build to share with us today? Yeah, I have the Warden build. So you could flex one of the sets. I'll talk about that in a second. But it's going to be five medium, or sorry, five heavy, one medium, one light. It's orders body and front bar two hand orders. It's in the two handed orders axe sharpened. Wait, you said orders body and then front bar orders? So yeah, it's it's like orders body pieces and then you front bar two hand orders axe. Oh, I see. So just like three body pieces of orders. I got you. Right. Okay. The back bar, Drooly, and gloves are Phoenix Moth. Um, so that way you can kind of take this in the solo, duo, or even group play. It's an ice staff, and you can use defending or power. Powered's better, uh, especially in group play. Uh, I, defending, it's not that massively of a difference uh, in solo. Uh, now I use Death Dealers, and I use Heavy Belord Monster Set. So both are heavy. Okay. Gallant Chain, Reinforced, and all jewelry are infused. Uh, this build's got over 100% crit damage, 40% uh, crit chance in solo. You have Contingency with Flame Damage, Class Mastery, and Minor Recoveries. So you're going to be at about 2k mag and stam recovery. And Sugar Skulls, so 26k max mag pool, 35k HP. That's how I like to play it. I don't like to like just stack it to like 50k. You could. Um, I, I just prefer sure. having a bigger mag pool because that means more damage. And, yeah. and, just, and kind of more sustain too. Anyway. Yeah, a lot more sustain. Um, that rather than so, you have such high crit chance that like one polar becomes very valuable. Oh yeah. This build I've used against I've used against your group. I also played it last night as well. I was able to one shot my boy Shoddy Magician, so it's quite strong. Him with the twelve k shocks, it's it's got quite the juice on it. If you could one shot Shoddy Magician, I mean that that's an accomplishment, I would say. Yeah, it's got over. Six that once you're in Northern Storm and everything, six thousand weapon spell damage, over forty percent crit chance, one hundred twelve percent crit damage, um, and that can go higher depending on whatever cross buffs you guys got. Or uh, it's got about twenty four and a half, twenty five k pen self buffed, um, and your wrecking blow is your spammable. And I I hit consistently hit over nine k wrecking blows. I've hit over eleven k on it. It's insane. That's a that's a throwback. I remember back what well, was Dizzy Swing back in the day, but uh, Dizzy Wardens, man, that was like the thing that you saw in Battlegrounds. They were unstoppable. It was unbelievable how strong they were. I played one as well. It just kind of brings back those memories. Now I, I should say you can swap orders with Acuity. Uh, Acuity's great and all, but your healing um, between Acuities are pretty lackluster, and that's why I do enjoy orders. It's more consistent. It's more snappy. It's just really fast. And you can lo you can do kind of the similar stuff. Like you're 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 okay, but if your team really needs that one warden uh, to heal the group, especially when like there's rules limiting how many uh, classes you can have each, there's only one warden allowed. Generally, they rely on that warden for the cross healing, and it's pretty important to have decent cross healing and crit chance for that. Uh, Miss Yusha in the chat is asking how to survive playing against God mode pressure as a healer. What's the secret? Cross healing. So you can't <laughs> you can't just go in and expect one healer to carry everybody. Uh, you have to have make everybody run echo. So that's step one. Um, I've seen Yusha's heals. Her heals are very sufficient. Um, but you want to have maybe a burst heal on most other people in the group, which is another limiting thing. On uh, you have a Zerb Light build. Generally, you can't fit in a burst heal in that setup, right? So. Yeah. That's just another example of a weakness to a Zerblight, generally. Um, and like counter-alting properly. Uh, so that could be... Jibbers are great and all, but if your jibber is only hitting 6k, that's not a 20k barrier. It's not going to prevent the burst that's happening. Yeah, jibber is not a guaranteed... I've noticed that jibber is not a guaranteed survive ultimate you know like cause it's consumable people can get through that thing pretty quick and then it's just like you have nothing now yeah you know we've got our timing down really good and so we limit that global to be very small and so it becomes more difficult to uh, maddie's very 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 good healer he, he defensive vaults very well so if you can get that timing down very well uh that's what makes a really good healer Every single time we go in, he's, he's got that thing popped perfectly. However, if that was a barrier instead of a jibber, I actually think your guys' survivability would go up massively. I may try uh, that. So you have 
Yeah, if you instead of like that 6k against our target, if that becomes 20k plus, that's a lot stronger. Plus the shielding from all the other shields of so potentially over 30k. Okay, yeah, that's a good thing to try. I was definitely using Jibber. But... And then, yeah, just getting more cross healing. I had a question I was going to ask, but now it slipped my mind. Oh, well. Hope that answers your question, Yusha. Uh, oh, yeah, I remember. It wasn't a question. I was just going to add to um, like um, doing defensive ults with good timing. I remember um, Shadi, you guys' as healer, he wrote a kind of an article on our Discord server talking about just like healing tips and stuff. Very, very informative. But he's basically saying like you want to be pretty generous with your Restu ults. You know, like you want to just hit those things. Like anytime you think there might be a problem, like even if it turns out not to be a big problem, just go ahead and do it. You know, and you'll have another one soon enough. Which he's right. If your team has proper cross healing, if you only have like one other burst heal on the team, it's very scary to hit your Restu ult and the team, the other team has an ulted. You know, so that can be pretty sketchy. Um, yeah, true. but he's right on a, on a well prepared team with like everybody having some, some decent amount of cross healing to where if they do alt and you had already used your rest alt for just, you know, it's four V four V four. So another team alts you and then they get your alt. You don't have an alt ready and the other team goes to alt you. You need to be able to get a little distance. You're block casting your heels on whoever's getting hit and keep them up. Let's move on. Let's talk about some emails. So uh, scrollingpodcast at gmail.com. That's the email address. If you want to send us an email, that's where you can send it. First email comes from Chumpy, and uh, he's got a riddle for us. So I'm going to read this riddle, but let's not answer right now, okay? We're going to read this. We'll move on and, and get to the rest of our emails, and then we'll circle back around to see if listeners have, have figured the riddle out. So the riddle is, it goes over your body a bit like a blanket. It comes out slowly. Don't work if you yank it. Unlike a blanket, it's the width of two mice. If you don't use it once, you might not use it twice. What is it? Chumpy says he'll give us the answer next week if we don't get it. Pretty sure I already have the answer, but let's give listeners a chance to, to think on it, and uh, we'll circle back around. <laughs> Yusha, Ms. Yusha says a condom. I don't think that's it. Uh, let's see. It goes, goes over your body a bit like a blanket. I don't know if it fits that. I don't know. I'm pretty sure I know the answer. We'll circle back around here in a minute. So thanks for writing, Chumpy. Uh, next email comes from Brandon. This is regarding on the la last episode, um, we were talking about the Sorcerer passive that um, they changed it so that it only uh, gets affected by permanent pets. So like if you're using the Engine Guardian monster set, for example, it doesn't interfere with that. I can't remember the name of the passive, but you either get max resources or max health, depending on if you have a pet active or not. And so um, there was a thing in the patch notes saying that um, non-class permanent pets will count to activate this passive. And we were thinking, what are they talking about? What non-class permanent pets are there? But uh, Brandon chimed in, and uh, one, one obvious one is if you're a werewolf, the, the pack leader morph, where you have those dire wolves following you around, that would count to, to get the extra health there. I can't really think of any others, though. Can you? Um, yeah, other than Engine Guardian, potentially. Um, I'm not sure if Engine like the Guardian roster... does not count. I, oh. I tested that out, Engine Guardian, which is good. That means I'm going to go back to Engine Guardian next patch because I didn't like that. Because you know, it spawns and despawns all the time, so your health bar is jumping up and down, but that won't be the case anymore. <laughs> There's also uh, that set that spawns the the Daedroth. Um, oh, yeah, so yeah. potentially that one, maybe I don't know if that counts as permanent because I think that despawns too, doesn't it? It does, yeah. We'd have to test it out. I'm, I want to say just like the matriarch and the scamp and yeah, like the the werewolf thing. I can't really think of much else. Yeah, like I, if it's that only have to be proc to recast. If it's only the werewolf one, they should have just said the werewolf tire. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but maybe there's something we're not thinking of. But yeah. anyway, thanks Brandon for for pointing that out. It's actually the only emails we have this week. So I'll read the riddle one more time. It goes over your body a bit like a blanket. It comes out slowly. Don't work if you yank it. Unlike a blanket, it's the width of two mice. And the most important line, I think, if you don't use it once, you might not use it twice. It's actually a perfect line. Um, I'm pretty sure it's a seat belt in an automobile, right? It goes over your body. It's only the width of two mice. It, it comes out slowly. Don't work if you yank it, right? If you pull the seatbelt quickly, it gets stuck. You can't pull it out. And if you don't use it once, you might die 
and not get to use it again, you know? <laughs> so, pretty sure it's a seatbelt. So, Chumpy, he'll write us in, I'm sure, and let us know if we got it right or not. You think, what do you think? You think that's, that, that's the right answer, Constantine? I think seatbelt is the same thing I was thinking of, yeah. It's got to be, right? It's either that or condom. One <laughs> Uh, thanks for writing, Chumpy. And once again, scrollingpodcast at gmail.com. Uh, it can be game-related or not. Send us an email. We'd love to hear from you. Shout out to the chat. Thanks for being here, Miss Yusha and Outlaw Red. Good to see you as always. Shout out to our friends. We have, what, Uncle Sam, Shoddy Magician, Six Zero, Ironworks, Miss Yusha, Outlaw Red, Knox DeVille, Kawaii Cats. I, I, you know, so many people I'm sure I'm not naming right now. We've all just been playing a lot lately. We have just such an awesome crowd of people want to buy my dog uh sir newbie i'm just thinking of names as i'm going here Na- napalm yeah awesome awesome people it's been awesome having you all around shout out to the elder goons the people that have been around for a long time i uh, really appreciate you guys very much very very much the booner goons the patreon supporters thomas grizzly con gummy bear toadster pork body taggard mother of dragons jim sudica maxwell derpin stuff brewer man redhead monster chumpy john e danger Joe, FK, Bullby, Mr. Windsor, and Sammy Verse. Thank you all very, very much. And one final shout out, of course, to my guest, Constine. Thank you very much for being here, man. Anything you want to plug or any final thoughts before before we go? Uh yeah, thanks for having me. So I have a YouTube channel. It's just like just fun videos, little montages. It's just at Constine77 on YouTube. Well, I appreciate you being here. We'll have to do it again sometime soon. Yeah, it was great. And um, thank you all for listening, and we'll see you next time.